Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be looking at the different kinds of sampling methods. So the sampling methods are the random and non-random ways that we might go about actually selecting our sample. So we're going to look at two different non-random ways, convenience sampling and self-selected sampling. And then we're going to look at the four main ways of doing random sampling. So whenever we can, ideally we would like to be doing random sampling. Non-random sampling tends to increase the chance that we will have a biased sample. So two common ways of doing non-random sampling are convenience sampling and self-selected sampling. Both of these would normally be chosen as a sampling method when we're limited by time or possibly budget and we really need to get some data and we need to be aware that the data that we're going to get is maybe not going to be ideal. When we're looking at other people's studies it's important to see whether they've stated how they've gone about their sampling and if they've used one of these methods then we need to consider that uh, perhaps their results are more likely to have a bias to them. So convenience sampling is exactly what it sounds like. It's really just doing whatever is the easiest way of going and getting some data. So if it's face-to-face -face data then the people that you see with clipboards out on the street or in the shopping mall who come up to you and want to survey you, that's an example of convenience sampling. They've chosen to be at the mall because there's lots of people there or on the street because there's lots of people there and since there's lots of people it's going to be easy for them to be able to find people to survey. Big problem with this is that it limits who could possibly be selected. If they're in a particular shopping mall on a particular day, then the only people who could possibly be selected are people that go to that mall and happen to be there on that day at that time. Beyond that, the people have to agree to the survey as well, but there'll be a whole lot of people that never go to that shopping mall, so they don't even have a chance of being selected. So a self-selected sample is one where the participants opt into the sample themselves. So common examples where we would see self-selected sampling is quite often on a, a news website. There might be a little poll and you can just choose to be in the poll. Uh, quite often on uh, TV news shows there might be either a uh, phone number to te or a number to text to or a website to go to or a Twitter hashtag to give your view. Self-selected sampling tends to create a bias because the people who are most likely to respond to them are the ones who have strong views on whatever it is that is being asked about. So when we can we want to try and avoid non-random sampling but sometimes if we have limited time or we have limited budget and we, we need some kind of data um, we, we need to go with this. So the first of our four random sampling methods is called simple random sampling. With simple random sampling you can imagine that really it's like drawing out of a hat. Uh, we have a list of our population and then we draw some random numbers which tell us which of that population we want to select. So for some populations this makes things very easy. It's easy to analyze, it's easy to do. Um, you can imagine that if I have a list of my population of interest, so it could be something like the electoral roll, uh, it could be uh, some sort of company record, subscriber database, something like that. I just have a list of people and I just pick random numbers or if I'm using Excel using a database it has functions to just pick, pick out rows, pick out people randomly and that's my sample. Sometimes it's not going to be very good though. If I had to do face-to-face uh, surveying, maybe I'm doing health study, I need to take some measurements, I need blood tests, I need something where I need to be face to face with the person, uh, then simple random sampling is in a lot of cases is going to be a bit tricky. Uh, you can imagine particularly if we had uh, the whole all of Australia was my population of interest. We don't want to have to travel back and forth all over Australia to find the people that we've randomly selected. 
So in that case, we'd probably need to use uh, some slightly smart, smarter way of going about our sampling. But sometimes we've got a small population, we've got a list of all of the people or all of the units. Uh, this can be a very nice, easy way for us to go about doing our random sampling. Our second method is called stratified sampling. For stratified sampling, as we will have particular subgroups within our population and these are going to be groups that we want to ensure get reflected in our sample. So the most common and simple variant is what's called proportionate stratified sampling. So we'll choose particular characteristics, so let's say gender, and in our random sample we want to ensure that our ratio of males to females in the sample represents the ratio of males to females in the population. Depending on how we're going about our sampling will depend on quite how we do this. A very common way uh, though is to do some screening at the start of our questionnaire. If you've ever done any web questionnaires you'll commonly notice they ask your age, your gender, your state uh, as the first couple of questions and sometimes they'll say sorry we've, we've got enough people who, who match you in our study already. So what they're doing is they're strat doing a stratified sample. They've worked out that they need a certain number of males and females and people of different age groups and people from different states uh, and once they hit, a, um, hit that number, hit that quota in a particular group then they won't accept anyone else from that group. They'll only be taking people from the other groups that they're still trying to get enough numbers. Really nice thing with stratified sampling is that it can definitely improve the accuracy of our results because we're ensuring that these groups and it might be gender, it might be age, it might be some other uh, characteristics are being reflected in our sample. One thing that can make it tricky though is that we do need to have some prior information about our population. If I don't know the ratio of males to females in the population then I can't stratify by gender in my sample. Our next method is called cluster sampling. With cluster sampling again we have some groups but the groups are slightly different this time. So this is where we're, in we're interested in individual units, so it could be people, but we're looking for ways that these people cluster into groups. So for example, if I was interested in sampling school students, instead of randomly selecting school students, instead I could do a cluster sample where I randomly select some schools. So my random selection won't be of the individuals, it'll actually be of these clusters or these groups. So I will randomly select some schools and then I will go and survey the students at these schools. So anywhere where the, the items or the people we're interested in are naturally clustering into groups, this is potentially a method that we could use. It's nice because it is an easier way to give a much larger sample size for us. Uh, another example could be if we were interested in hospital patients. Instead of choosing patients, instead we could randomly choose hospitals. And that would give us a whole lot of patients altogether. Our last method is what's called systematic sampling. So with systematic sampling uh, we will normally have some sort of list of our um, population or the data that we're trying to sample from and we'll find a random starting point and from our random starting point then we're going to take every, and I've said kth item, but it's going to be some number, it might be every 10th or 20th or 30th or 50th or 100th, but it's going to be sampling at a equal spaced interval. So systematic sampling, we have ra the random part is where we start from, but once we've got our starting point, then we're going in even amounts counting through our data. So sometimes this is not very useful at all, but for some uh, business applications in particular, quality control is one and auditing is another. Uh, this can be a much easier way to carry out our sampling. Uh, it can give us a spread across our sample. Uh, the only danger is every so often if we're very unlucky we could miss a particular pattern. So you can imagine that maybe my systematic sampling if I was uh, doing audit and I was doing a bad job of it and so I decided I'm just going to look at transactions from a Monday afternoon but the person who's defrauding the company does that every Thursday then my pattern matches theirs but they're, they're offset by a little bit so I'm never going to catch them. Of course only selecting 
transactions from a Monday afternoon would be quite a poor way of using systematic sampling for the audit. Uh, but what I might do is maybe I will go every 100th transaction or every 50th receipt or something where I can count through very nice and easily um, but maybe not on that every Monday afternoon so so a different different frequency so that I uh, will hopefully catch out that person that's defrauding on a Thursday afternoon so those are our four methods in practice what quite, oh, quite often happens is they get put together so we can use each of them individually but we can also put them together so for instance when I was talking about my cluster sample where I randomly choose some schools I might decide that I'm going to cluster sample and I'm randomly choosing some schools but I'm also making it stratified so I'm going to stratify the school by maybe whether it's public and private so I'm making sure that my cluster sample I'm randomly choosing schools but I'm making sure I get the right ratio of public to private or single sex to uh, mixed sex schools or urban and rural schools um, high socioeconomic, mid socioeconomic, low socioeconomic so I can apply stratification to the cluster sample maybe when I've selected the schools or my other example hospitals when I've selected the hospitals maybe that place is too big to survey everyone so maybe once I get to the school I do a cluster sample where I randomly choose some classes or maybe I get the role and I do a systematic sample of students off the role so I can mix and match and put the different methods together in a way that's going to suit me being able to collect uh, a good sample. So a sample where I'm hopefully not introducing any biases, I'm selecting randomly, um, and is also going to match whether I need to be face to face, if I'm using telephone, using the internet, that kind of thing for actually collecting my data. This has been a Swinburne production.